And believe it or not, chapter 5 is probably my most favorite chapter. It's on proving uh, trig identities. Now we've actually started, uh, or we'll be starting the chapter where you'll be allowed to use uh, the back cover of your textbook. You can see it's starting with, um, starting with section 5.1, going the whole way through chapter 5, you have a ton of different types of identities and properties as we go through each section of chapter 5. You know, you have your sum and difference identities, uh, product sum identities, double angle, half angle identities. I'm not going to require you to memorize all of those identities. You'll be able to use the, the back cover of your book on your tests. However, I say that with asterisks beside that. Whoever you end up taking, even if you have to take uh, some type of calculus class, I don't know whether you take it here, I don't know if you're going to take it somewhere else, if you're going to transfer to some school. Whoever you have for calculus may require that you have these memorized. I just, I don't have an answer to that question. Just know that I'm not going to require it, but down the road, you may be asked to, to have those memorized. What you're seeing right up front, first off, is a review of other identities that we've talked about already. We just haven't called them identities. An identity is an equation that's true for every single domain value that you could plug into the equation, every single one. When you solve an equation in algebra, chances are you're coming up with the value of x, and it's only a single value of x, or two values of x, of a quadratic equation, right? You get two answers. There you're coming up with specific values that, that make the equation true. And an equation is an identity when we say that no matter what x value we pick, <coughs> if we plug it in, it makes it a true statement, okay? We're going to take these fundamental identities that you already know, we have what's called the reciprocal identities that you already are aware of. We have the quotient identities, meaning tangents, the same thing as sine divided by cosine, cotangents, cosine divided by sine. And we have the Pythagorean identities that we've already talked about. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals one and the two other uh, counterparts to that. I don't know if we've talked about negative angle identities or not. Uh, this has to do with whether a function's odd or even turns out that the sine of negative theta is the same thing as negative sine theta. We may have already talked about these. I just can't remember if we, if we did or not. Are these all, all that you're seeing right here in this first page, all of those should be in the back of your book listed under section 5.1. Are they there? They are. Great. What I want to show you with our first problem, before we actually, and, and the, 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 the main part of chapter 5, as you'll see, is verifying what we call verify trig identities, where I give you a trig identity and you're supposed to show that it is an identity, meaning it, it's true no matter what value of x or what value that we use for theta uh, use, based upon our fundamental identities. Um, that's, that's the, I'd say, 40% of this chapter. But also, uh, you're going to be, th you're gonna be uh, asked to complete um, some short answer type questions, just like the one that we're going to see here. We're going to do this problem, uh, we're going to do A, B, and C, an older method, and then we're going to go back and revisit part A again just to show you how you can use your trig identities to maybe make a problem a little bit more easier or a little bit faster than using the, the old methods. So taking a look at this problem as we would have in our earlier chapters, it says let's pretend that you know that the tangent of this angle is negative 5 thirds. You also know that this angle is in quadrant 2. Find each of the following. So an older method that we learned was let's go ahead and draw this angle that's in quadrant two. So somewhere over here we have point P. Here is this angle theta that we're talking about. Locate point P somewhere on the terminal side, drop the perpendicular. And we know that the tangent of an angle is the same thing as y over x. So according to this picture, knowing that the angle is in quadrant 2, y would have to be positive 5, x would have to be negative 3. With me so far. Now I can find my, y, or my r value using Pythagorean theorem. r squared is equal to 5 squared plus negative 3 squared. 25 and 9 make 34. So r ends up being the square root of 34. And then with those three pieces, right, you can get all your trig functions, sine, cosine, tangent, and, and the reciprocals. So A, come up with what the secant 
of this angle is, we know that the secant using the above uh, reciprocal identity is 1 over cosine theta. And that is equal to what? Cosine theta, according to this picture, cosine is x over r. That would be negative 3 over the square root of 34. But we're going to turn around and take its reciprocal for the secant. So this would be negative root 34 over 3. Now after we finish part b and part c, we're going to go back to part a and do that one a second way. And I'm going to leave it completely up to you which method you would like to use. Part B, sine of this angle is y over r. That would be 5 over the square root of 34. But then I've got to rationalize the denominator, and we get 5 root 34 over 34. Part C, find me the cotangent of negative theta. And according to our above uh, identity, the one listed right here, the cotangent of negative theta is the same thing as the opposite of cotangent theta. And cotangent, we know, is reciprocal of tangent. We're given what that one is. We don't even have to use our triangle. We're told right here, hey, tangent is negative 5 thirds. So we're going to flip that and then also take its opposite. So the opposite of cotangent theta ends up simply being positive 3 fifths. So those are your three solutions for that problem. Questions about A, B, or C? Now, like I said, I want to revisit part A. And uh, we're going to go back and use one of our Pythagorean identities and not even use this picture. Delete some stuff here. Oh, I did it again. I guess I'll do it this way. There we go. Let's go back and uh, let's just focus on, do you see a Pythagorean identity that ties tangent with secant? Read it. What is it? Which one is it? Tangent squared theta plus 1 equals secant squared theta. Tangent squared theta plus 1 is equal to secant squared theta. And we know what tangent theta is, right? Tangent theta is negative 5 thirds. So what we have now is that negative 5 thirds squared plus 1 is equal to secant squared theta. Negative 5 thirds squared would be positive, right? Negative times negative gives you positive. We get 25 ninths plus 1, which I'm going to write 1 as 9 ninths equals secant squared theta. Simplify a little more. We get 34 over 9. 34 over 9 equals secant squared. And now we take the square root of both sides. Now technically, right, when we take the square root of both sides, we would get secant squared. I'm sorry, take the square root of both sides. You just got secant theta equals plus or minus the square root of 34 over 9. And we know how to take the square root of a fraction, right? The square root of the top over the square root of the bottom. And we get the square root of 34 over 3. But what about the plus or minus? Well, that's where we have to go back up and use what other fact? What quadrant am I in? And if I'm in quadrant 2, we know that uh, what sine is positive in quadrant 2, which means it's reciprocal. Cosecant is positive in quadrant 2. So we have to choose, right? That's the only downfall. You have to, to know that it's plus or minus. However, you've got to choose the right sign that corresponds with what quadrant that you're in. And that was the same answer that we got earlier, right? Does it matter to me which method that you use? Absolutely not. I'm just throwing out that you have options. But in some cases, do you have to use that one, like that? Uh, you always can use the other one. I don't know. That would depend on the problem. Yeah. The, the, the way that this problem is worded, you have a choice. I'm not saying you're, you're going to have a choice every time. OK. 
Now the next two problems, the intent of these problems, are to start getting you to think about or getting ready to verify a trig identity. Using the only, the only identities at this point that you're allowed to use are those listed on uh, the section 5-1 square. It's also on the first page of the handout that we just addressed. But you and I are going to try to come up with expressing cosine x in terms of nothing but tangents. Nothing but tangents. So does anybody have any idea how in the world we're going to do that? We want you to come up with some kind of equivalent expression using nothing but tangents that's the same thing as uh, cosine x. Do we have any identities that, that pair those two together? Um, any of your Pythagorean identities, any of your other identities that somehow uh, capture some kind of relationship between uh, cosine and tangent? Now, I'm not saying there's only one way to do some of these problems. Uh, sometimes there's more than one way to do these problems. Sine equals tan times sine. Whoa, tan times sine. Yeah. Okay. Does tan equals sine over cosine? I agree with that. Then how are you going to get rid of the sine? Well, I was just thinking the, to rewrite it since you wrote cosine x equals, yeah. Let's start with, um, what's the reciprocal of cosine? 1 over cosine. 1 over what? Secant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 1 over secant theta. Now, we know that Pythagorean identity, the tangent squared, is it 1 plus secant squared? Yeah. Or secant squared plus 1. So therefore, secant squared is equal to tangent squared minus 1. And if we take the square root of both sides, secant theta is plus or minus the square root of tangent squared minus 1. Is this identity right? No. What should it be? Uh, secant squared minus 1. Is tangent squared? Yes. So that should be a minus. My apologies. That's a minus which makes that a plus, which makes that a plus. So now let's do a substitution. Right here we're saying that secant theta, I'm not saying your, your method would have got you, probably if you would continued on, you'd end up with the same answer. But I just didn't know how you were going to get rid of your sign. But we're going to do a substitution here. We'll take out the secant x, the secant theta, and put in 1 over plus or minus square root of tangent squared theta plus 1. And then you all know we can't leave a radical in the denominator. So this will be plus or minus square root tangent squared theta plus 1 over tangent squared theta plus 1. And there you would have to leave the plus or minus in the problem. I mean, we have no idea what x is. We have no idea what, you know, what quadrant that we're working with. All I know is that I now have some expression that's equivalent to cosine x according to whatever quadrant that I'm working in. Now the, again, the purpose of this exercise is to get you start to start thinking, how can I use my identities to show that two expressions are the, are the same thing, one and the same thing. And notice all I have over here are tangents. Let's take a look at another example. Here they want you to take tangent theta plus cotangent theta and come up with an expression that uses nothing more than sines and cosines. So let's start with the, the one that we're, we're transforming. Let's start with tangent theta plus cotangent theta. And we want to somehow transform that so it's equal to something using nothing more than sines and cosines. Well, to start off, let's take each one in particular. Let's just convert everything to sines and cosines. We know the tangent, right, is the same thing as sine over cosine. 
and we know that cotangent is the same thing as cosine over sine. Now we just can't leave it like that. You know, to add two fractions together, we want to get a common denominator, put everything together, and let's see what happens. So my common denominator will be sine theta cosine theta. Take a look at the first fraction. What am I missing? I'm missing the sine theta right in the denominator. So I'm going to multiply the numerator by uh, sine theta, which gives me sine squared. I lost you. What I'm, I'm I got the, let me I know how to get the common denominators. That's right. I'm, what, what I'm showing you right here is notice that if we were to cancel out a sine theta out of top and bottom, we get the statement above it. Okay. On the right hand side, right, I'm missing the factor of uh, cosine theta, so I multiply top by cosine theta, it gives me cosine squared theta. Now that I have common denominator, we can combine this all into one fraction. So we get sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta over the common denominator, sine theta cosine theta. But what's the numerator equal to? One. One of your Pythagorean identities, right? Sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one. So this is nothing more than one over sine theta, cosine theta. That is crazy. These two statements, this guy right here, if you were to pick some angle measure, theta, plug it into that one, or plug it into this one, you'll get the same thing. Those two statements, for any value of theta, that's the thing about an identity. We're not saying it just works for special values of theta, it works for any value of theta. Those are equivalent to one another. Do you see what they mean by rewrite this expression using nothing but sines and cosines, right? Does it have to be in radians, degrees, either? Uh, either one. Should work either way. Now let me show you what you're getting ready to do. Here's what's going to happen in the next section. I give you this, I give you this, and I say, show me that they're equivalent to one another. Show me how they're equivalent to one another, is what we're getting ready to do. Isn't it fun?